that we may embody the generosity of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Well, and it will be 
back on his own and come see us. Mary Holman uh, is doing well down in Westminster. She's uh, apparently her leg has healed. She's just kind of waiting for another month or so for her hip to heal. So we're hoping that she'll be back among us uh, pretty soon as well. Carl's nephew, Kevin Conrad, is also doing better. We understand that. There's some pretty difficult times. Uh, we are praying for Mary Lou Satin, a friend of uh, Carla and Bill's. Uh, she is facing cancer. Scott Waldron, a uh, friend, distant relative to Marie, has had a cardiac arrest. Uh, yeah, he had his bone marrow transplant and stem cell transplant did well for a week. Uh, ended up, apparently, he has a stomach infection, which they can't do anything for. They can't do surgery because he has no white cell. Today our first reading comes to us from the Proverbs. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading responsibly from Psalm 112. Hallelujah. Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in God's commandments. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their heart is established in the Lord, until they secure the desire of the They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their head with honor. Our second reading comes to us from the letter to the Hebrews. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Let those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life 
and imitate them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the first the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to John, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethzatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take up your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends, God's mercy and grace to you in fullest measure. Amen. I have only 15 minutes or so, so let me start with the creation of the whole universe, okay? Okay, that was supposed to be a chuckle. You remember how it is told in the book of Genesis that God created everything in six days. And at the end of it, it says, on the seventh day, God rested from his labors. So we have Almighty God to thank for Labor Day holiday, or at least for the Sabbath day, because it's what God intended from the start. And I don't take that lightly, as our parks and our beaches and and highways and airways are filling up on this three-day weekend, it's easy for most people to forget. It is God that we thank, not modern wage and hour laws or stuff like that for the invention of the weekend. It is God we thank. It's God we thank for the idea of a holiday where everybody gets some time off for relaxation and refreshment and for a time to just de-stress and and gather our strength again. Rest and relaxation are hardwired into God's design of the universe. Two things to note about that story uh, from the book of Genesis. 
One, because God took the day off, so do we. Because God took the day off, so does everyone who must labor and toil to take care of themselves and their families. In the Law of Moses, it's very clear that everybody, including the servants and the slaves and even the beasts of burden, are entitled to their rest and refreshment. So while we may be enjoying a, a long weekend, we should remember to say thanks to God for those who are working on Sundays and even on Monday holidays in order to make our time of relaxation possible. They too must have their days off because God ordered everything from the beginning to operate that way. And we should remember that some people really don't get days off anymore because they're working two or even three jobs to make ends meet in these tough economic times. We pray for them also because they're entitled to a decent wage and to a Sabbath day and a holiday. I'm mindful also, when you think about it, of the, the terrible fire which is still raging in the California mountains, the rim fire which has already invaded Yosemite and is destroying the beautiful natural environment that thousands, millions, I guess, of tourists have enjoyed for generations. The firefighters have no days off right now. They won't until this monster is contained. So today we pray for them also and give thanks for their labors. The other thing to note from the creation story, it's not even in front of you, but you know it, I think, pretty well, is it says on the seventh day God rested from his labors. We might laugh, but you notice it does not say on the seventh day God retired. You know, did you ever think about that? So we assume that there was more work to be done after the creation is finished. If God is creator, there was more creating to be done. To say nothing of all the repairs in the universe that there must be, right? Because we don't read Genesis very often, we forget how things are ordered and how they, how they operate. If the whole creation is anything like my backyard, it would have fallen apart millions of years ago without God's constant God always has work to do. Amen? It gets done because God has the world on a very strict maintenance schedule, if you will. Every fall after the harvest, the leaves drop, and, and the weather cools, the plants rest, animals hibernate. You get the picture. Because the very cycles of nature uh, allow the world to restore itself. And water and snow and ice. Where's the ice? I can use some of that right now. They actually help the creation to heal and to rest and then be ready for the spring. So both the weekly cycle with its Sabbath rest and the annual cycle of the seasons are built in by God. In the Gospel reading for this morning, Jesus is criticized for an act of mercy when he healed somebody on a Sabbath day. That was the day when nobody was supposed to work. Depends on what you think of as work. The man who was healed is first criticized for carrying his bedroll with him. I mean, this is the man who was crippled and confined to that bedroll, that mat, for 38 years. So when the criticism comes to Jesus, just imagine, picture this in your mind's eye, that Jesus is like rolling his eyes with that kind of criticism. I mean, like these people miss the whole point. It's mercy, guys. It's not work. It's mercy. God's mercy in healing someone. It's not for anybody's gain. It's not for wages. It's not for profit. It's kindness and generosity, okay? But just to make sure that the critics get it, Jesus adds this sentence, my father is still working, and I also am working. There is work to be done by the creator of our universe. There is work to be done by the Savior of the world. Thank God for that. Now, from here on, we've got a bit of a problem. From the time that little Lutherans were uh, knee-high to a grasshopper, they say, we've been taught that we are saved by grace through faith. We don't earn our salvation. It's a 
parallels our word works. Mitzvah is sometimes translated as commandments, but it can also just mean a good thing, a good deed. The Ten Commandments are the Ten Mitzvot. There are actually 613 different mitzvot in the Torah, the books of Moses. They are both positive and negative commands. So in addition to the, the ones you know, that we don't like, the thou shalt not, that stuff, there are commandments without the not. Thou shalt, for example, remember the Sabbath day to keep it whole. And thou shalt, other the commandments, honor thy father and thy mother so that the days may be long for thee in the land which the Lord thy God is given. But for Christians, as good and admirable as those rules or laws or mitzvot or commandments might be, for Christians, we know that we are not made righteous. We're not redeemed because we perfectly perform all that stuff or even approximate perfection. We're made righteous in God's eyes because we put our faith and our trust not in works or good deeds, but in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. We even avoid sometimes good works so as not to give the appearance of trying to gain Christ or, or to earn God's favor and say that we don't need God's amazing grace because we're doing everything perfectly anyway and it's going to just come out of the balance sheet that, that God will be impressed. So that's where we get in trouble. There's a, an old joke I remember from my seminary days and you know maybe it's not a joke after all. The minister is calling upon an elderly man who is getting close to death to give him some comfort and some assurance that, that he should uh, be, be trusting God to be there for him and should his heart give out that he will be with the Lord forever. Oh, Pastor, says the elderly man, kind of waving away, I know already that, that I am going to heaven because I've never done a good work in my whole life. As if work itself is to be avoided in order to qualify for grace. As if we impress God by our absolute reliance on grace and it's accompanied by leverage. In the business of our economy, that would be like saying, I don't work and I don't need to work because I'm a welfare. And yet that misses the point, doesn't it? That sounds like entitlement. I don't work because I'm entitled to be taken care of. But my friends, God's grace is not an entitlement, it's a gift. I said that already. We don't just collect what's coming to us because if it were not for God's grace, there would be nothing there to collect. Nothing would be coming to us. But we give thanks to God for His gifts. Martin Luther taught and he, and he fought a battle mightily against, against good works as some kind of requirement for, for grace. Because he realized that, that stressing good works puts a heavy load or a burden on the backs of faithful people. Once they're told that they had to work in order to impress God to, to uh, be saved, to pay into some heavenly account, then they were afraid that they could never do enough and they would never earn enough and they could never achieve enough in order to guarantee they would be saved. So when Luther stressed St. Paul's word that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works of the law, he opened the floodgates to the gods of God. Christian complacency. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, nothing to do, cheap grace. I come to church once a year just to make sure God still loves me. That's all. Which is why I found this gospel so helpful. My father is working still. And I also. Again, maybe a, a good illustration comes from our childhood. We didn't earn that money that our parents told us was our allowance. We had chores to do, and sometimes our parents would maybe threaten to cut or withhold our allowance a bit until the chores got done. The discretionary spending in childhood was right there at the cake. We didn't straighten up the fly right then. And all those chores didn't have to be done in order to guarantee they would love you. We did those chores because we also love our families. And because, after all, the chores need to be done. Dishes need to be washed. Sidewalks need to be swept. Or, in some parts of the country, a shovel. The chores were not our way of earning. 
earning a place at our family table. They were a way of thanking our parents for the love that we knew we already had. Martin Luther put it this way, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. If we're following Jesus, if we imitate the man who healed even on the Sabbath day and who gave his life for us, then our response to his saying that he's still working and, and that we just would fall in line behind him and, and do work because Jesus works. Do what we can to show mercy and, and to be the hungry and to visit the sick and to encourage the prisoner. If, if we're honoring God, our Creator, our Heavenly Parent, then we will fall in alongside God. So my friends, I think is the, the genius of the Gospel and it's the genius of Christian ministry. We're not given some detailed list of good deeds in the Bible that, that we must do, do everything on the list or else. We're given a purpose in life, not a blueprint, a purpose to follow and to serve Christ by serving our neighbor, by helping those who can't help themselves, by lifting burdens off the backs of, of those who are beaten down, by raising the hopes of those who may be discouraged or depressed. That's Christian work. The stories of, of Christian work would fill a lot of books, work books, if you will. One of the stories that doesn't get told around here much uh, is the work of Thriving Financial for Lutherans. And this is not an ad, incidentally, but it's worth mentioning. Thriving Financial is an independent organization for uh, fraternal and charitable stuff and, and finances. And in recent years, Thriving has teamed up with Habitat for Humanity, you've probably all heard of that, another charitable and they are building together housing for the poor. Habitat and Thriven are active here in Los Angeles, building brand new housing for the poor. And they do it because Thriven kicks in the money and Lutheran church members do the volunteer labor. That is Christian ministry. God's work is creative work. You plan what you think you can do according to the, the gifts that you've been given. Today in our prayers, we celebrate the work that Christians do as we thank God for the, the opportunity to serve where service is desperately needed. For a small congregation, we do this not out of obligation or fear, but out of our awareness that, that there's a great need for, for good, good deeds, for mitzvot, and the awareness that also present. Jesus is among us right here, still working, still serving, still giving his life to change the lives of the people around us. Your work, your work for Christ is blessed because it's not an obligation.